Hello everybody, this is Sam Butchart and this is Lecture 4 for Critical Thinking, Semester 1, 2017. So let me start by reminding you about the two criteria for assessing or evaluating arguments. Uh, two different questions. First of all, do the premises support the conclusion? And secondly, are the premises true? Support, remember, means if the premises were all true, assuming the premises were all true, they would give you uh, sufficient reason to accept the conclusion as true. Uh, and we saw that there were two main types of support, deductive support, where if the premises are true, the conclusion would have to be true, couldn't be false. And inductive support, where although the argument's not deductively valid, still, if the premises are all true, they would give you a good reason, sufficient reason to accept the conclusion, because they make that conclusion almost certain, or much more likely, or something like that. So what we'll be doing in this lecture is looking in a bit more detail at this second question, are the premises true? So when should you accept a premise as true in an argument? Well, in a previous lecture and in the study guide, there's a list of questions here. Um, if the premise comes from some kind of expert authority or other reliable source, that might be a reason to accept it. It might be common knowledge or beyond reasonable doubt. Um, if it contradicts something else you know to be true, that's a reason to reject it. If it's a generalisation, some kind of general claim, uh, you can ask whether there are any counterexamples, and we'll be talking more about that in this lecture. If the premise offers an explanation of something, you can ask whether there are any plausible alternative explanations. That's something we'll look at in a bit more detail in the topic of arguments for causation. What we'll be doing today is looking just at evaluating premises which are backed up by some kind of appeal to an authority, by which I mean either an expert or an eyewitness observation, and premises which make general claims, generalisations. Um, we'll be looking at criteria you can use to evaluate the reliability of experts and witnesses, and we'll look at an example. And then moving on to generalisations, we'll talk about universal generalisations and counterexamples and statistical generalisations. Now, if this word statistical makes you want to run away and scream, don't worry, we're not going to be doing any formal statistics or mathematics. So it's very, very common to find premises in arguments or other claims backed up by some kind of appeal to an authority. You're asked to believe something because an expert says that it's true or because a supposed eyewitness says that they saw it happen. Now, some people use this term appeal to authority uh, to refer to a kind of fallacy, the fallacy of relying on inappropriate authorities. And we're going to talk about that, but I'm not using the term in that way. Uh, an appeal to authority may be appropriate or inappropriate. It depends on the authority and the claim that's being made. So what we will do is look at some simple criteria you can use to decide or judge whether or not an appeal to authority is reliable, appropriate or not. It would be silly to think that there's something always wrong with relying on experts because it's completely unavoidable. Um, we need to rely 
on experts all the time, for example, doctors and scientists and so on. Um, you can't go and find out everything for yourself. So we need to rely on other people who've got the relevant expertise and training or who have, who have done the appropriate research. The news is, of course, often, and um, the media more generally, is a common source of beliefs that we all have, which can end up as premises in arguments. Um, we need to rely on news and media to tell us about what's happening in the world. We can't all go and find out for ourselves. And, of course, in the law, eyewitness testimony, for example, is considered the kind of gold standard kind of evidence that you can have. So we need appeals to authority in this general sense. But, of course, not all news and media reports are accurate, especially these days in the world of fake news that we live in now. Witnesses can, of course, be unreliable. Experts get things wrong all the time, as do scientists. So there's room for critical thinking here and for evaluating authorities, sources, as I will call them. I'll use that general term. Evaluating them uh, to see whether they ought to be believed, to decide how reliable they are. And that's what we'll talk about next. As I've already mentioned, there are two main types of uh, source or authority, experts and witnesses. Um, the criteria for judging them uh, are essentially the same, although they apply in slightly different ways. Um, so as I go through each of the criteria that I'm going to talk about, I'll talk about how they apply to both experts and witnesses. So whatever the kind of source, here are the three questions or criteria you should ask. First of all, is the source in a position to know? Secondly, is there any reason to suspect the reliability of the source? And thirdly, is there any corroborating evidence from other independent sources? So I'll talk about each of these three criteria or questions in turn. So first, is the source in a position to know? In the case of experts, what this is asking is whether the source has relevant expertise or, and or qualifications. The key word here, of course, is relevant. Not every expert is an expert in absolutely everything. And this is a common source of what? people would sometimes call the fallacy of appeal to authority. It would be appealing to an authority who isn't really an expert in any kind of relevant field to the question under discussion. Um, Jamie White, in his book Crimes Against Logic, has a nice example of this. He talks about Einstein. Any opinion of Einstein seems to rate special attention no matter how far removed from physics. I have been told by several people that most of us use only 10% of our intellectual capacity. That's a very common little factoid that you often hear repeating. Human beings only use 10% of their brain. Um, you may have heard it before. Perhaps you believe it. Uh, Jamie White goes on. When I ask people why I should believe this, they tell me that Einstein said so. How he was in a position to know this, they can't say, but everybody knows how smart Einstein was. Well, now, the point here is that, well, Einstein is an expert, of course, in certain aspects of physics and certain aspects of mathematics, but not in cognitive science or psychology. So this claim isn't really the kind of thing that Einstein would be in a position to know, smart as he was. Um, so, as Jamie White goes on to say in the next paragraph, so don't be bullied. Just because Einstein said it was true doesn't necessarily mean it is true, um, unless it has something to do with physics or mathematics. By the way, as far as I can tell, um, Einstein never really did make this claim about human beings only using 10% of their brains. Um, but still... It's a nice example to illustrate the point. Einstein 
doesn't have relevant expertise in that kind of area. So not in a position to know. So for witnesses, the question of position to know is asking whether it's actually possible for them to have experienced what they claim to have experienced. Were they in the right place at the right time? Were, was there anything in the way obstructing their view? The kind of questions that a good detective or a lawyer might ask about uh, some piece of witness testimony. So that's position to know. The second question you can ask about any source is about reliability. Are there any reasons to think the source might be unreliable? Well, for both experts and witnesses, one question that's relevant is that particular source's reputation. Um, if they're a witness, are they known to make stuff up all the time? Are they one of those experts who's always coming out with controversial and usually eventually refuted outrageous claims? Question of motive is, of course, very important. Um, does the source have something to gain by lying or distorting the truth in some way? Financial motive is a very good example of that. Um, if uh, you go into a electronic store to buy a new laptop, for example, and you ask the salesperson, which is the best laptop for me to buy? Now, that person might be in a position to know the answer to that question in the sense that they might have lots of uh, relevant experience and knowledge about laptops. On the other hand, depending on how they get paid, it might be that they have a motive to try and sell you the most expensive laptop, or at least not the cheapest one. Uh, so this is a reason if they tell you you should buy this laptop to worry about their reputation because they've got a motive for not telling the truth. Financial motive's not the only kind of motive that can undermine the reliability of a source, but it's a very important one. If you're a newspaper editor, for example, and someone comes to you offering to sell you their story about their relationship with some very famous person, for example. Um, well, you ought to be a little bit suspicious about their reliability because um, they stand to gain a lot of money financially by just making something up or exaggerating it. And this is something that at least the more reputable newspaper editors are very well aware of, of course. Another important factor that might undermine the reliability of a source is bias. This is a matter of what the source's prior beliefs or expectations are. Sometimes the general worldview or political orientation of someone... Uh, can introduce uh, bias into some of their claims, which you need to think about when evaluating them as a source. More generally, and even in areas that are not particularly political or emotive, if you already believe something or expect it to be true, then that can introduce uh, bias into the way you evaluate the evidence for and against that claim. If you already believe something to be true, you're likely to overestimate the strength of arguments for that claim and underestimate how powerful the arguments against it are. That's an effect known as my side bias. A uh, closely related phenomena is confirmation bias, which has more to do with selection of evidence or search for evidence. If you already believe something, you're much more likely to notice and incorporate into your set of beliefs things which help confirm that belief you already accept. And you're much more likely to ignore or just fail to notice or in various ways not be exposed to information 
that undermines your belief. That's confirmation bias. Uh, and it affects all of us. Uh, it affects scientists and experts just as much as anyone else, which is why the scientific method has built into it the idea of uh, trying to get other people to replicate your findings, people who aren't maybe as invested in your pet theory as you are. Which is why replication of an experimental result by other scientists is so important. It's uh, one of the mechanisms for avoiding confirmation bias in science. So for witnesses, there are lots of different factors that might uh, undermine their reliability, even if the witness was in the right place at the right time and so on, so that they were in a position to know if they were emotional or drunk or on drugs. Of course, these are factors that can make perceptions less reliable, less accurate. If they were focusing on something else at the time, trying to do something else while they were observing the scene that they're reporting about, that can also severely undermine reliability. Um, I might post some material uh, on the very fascinating phenomenon known as inattentional blindness, which tells us how we can fail to notice even quite striking and remarkable things that are right in front of our faces if we happen to be focusing or thinking about something else at the time. Finally, let me just say, when it comes to witnesses, normally what people are really reporting when they report uh, something that they saw happen is they're reporting their memory of it. Unless the report uh, was made at the time while they were seeing it, um, it will invariably be based on memory. And the trouble with that is that, as cognitive scientists are now realising, memory is uh, very, very unreliable and very easily modifiable in quite scary ways sometimes. You can get people to think they remember things happening that didn't happen at all. The third criteria for evaluating sources then is this. Is there any corroborating evidence from independent sources? So in other words, do other sources agree? So in the case of experts, you can ask, well, what do other relevant independent experts say about this matter? How representative is the source's opinion of the sort of consensus view about that matter? Of course, pick any scientific topic you like, you'll be able to find people who are experts who are going to disagree with the uh, consensus opinion and they might be right. Sometimes the consensus opinion is wrong. Um, nonetheless, if you find an expert meteorologist, for example, who says that uh, global warming, for example, doesn't really exist, it's just a myth then the fact that the overwhelming consensus of scientific opinion is against them uh, ought to make you a little bit cautious, at least, in accepting the claim just on their say-so. For witnesses, of course, you can ask, well, were other people there at the time? Other people who are independent of your first witness, did they see the same thing? In all of this independence is very important. The corroborating evidence has to come from independent sources. So for example in the case of witnesses, let's suppose a group of people, four friends who all know each other well, uh, all claim to have seen a UFO in the night sky over Melbourne, um, but they, after having this experience they talked about it to each other and uh, went over the story again and again. Um, then those are no longer independent witnesses. So the fact that there are four of them uh, doesn't really add any much extra credibility to their claim. Whereas if a whole other group of people saw it, un completely unlinked, unrelated to those four, 
then that does add a bit of extra credibility. Another kind of case is where you get the same claim repeated again and again and again by lots of different people. So it looks like there's lots of corroboration, but all those people are relying on or referring to other sources. And when you trace back, you find that really it all traces back to one single scientific study, let's say, or one occasion on which Einstein said something. Um, so again, although it looks like lots and lots of people are all saying the same thing, that doesn't make the claim more credible because really it all refers back to a single source, which may or may not be credible. OK, before we go on, it's very important, I think, to emphasise that the kinds of considerations I've been talking about only apply where you're being asked to accept a claim, a premise in an argument, just on the basis of someone's say-so. So you're being asked to believe it just because a scientist has said that it's true or some witness has told you that they saw it. In other words, in cases where no argument has been given. If the source has actually given an argument or presented some evidence for their claim, then none of these considerations about uh, position to know, reliability, motive, corroboration and so on are really all that relevant. If the person has given an argument or presented some evidence for that claim, then you can and ought to evaluate that argument on its merits. To dismiss someone's claim on the basis not that their argument or evidence is bad, but on facts about the person presenting that argument uh, is a kind of fallacy, the fallacy known as ad hominem, which is Latin for at the man. It means at the person focusing your criticism on the person rather than the argument or the evidence they've given. And that really is a fallacy. So here's two examples of it. Jones has argued against the proposed new law to ban poker machines, but she works for a company that makes poker machines, so we can dismiss her arguments. Well, no, you can't. If Jones just asked you to take her word for it that the law banning poker machines was a bad law then we wouldn't believe her just because she said so, given that she works for a company that makes poker machines. But she's given an argument. She's presented some evidence. So we ought to go and look at that argument. And facts about the person giving the argument are never relevant to whether the argument is a good one. The question just becomes, are the premises true? And do those premises, assuming they are true, support the conclusion? Jamie White, in the book Crimes Against Logic that I mentioned before, uh, calls this kind of thing, a special case of this kind of thing, the motive fallacy. It's the, well, you would say that, wouldn't you, fallacy. Uh, again, this is a fallacy when someone's presented an argument or given some reasons, but instead of bothering to engage with their argument or uh, have tried to evaluate that argument, you simply dismiss what they say out of hand by saying, well, yes, you would say that, wouldn't you? You've got a motive or some kind of reason for saying that. Well, of course, people always have motives. Um, Jamie White points out this is very common in politics when a politician uh, makes a proposal for a new law and backs that uh, proposal up with some evidence or argument about why that's a good thing. And someone says, oh, well, we can dismiss that. Um, they're just trying to get elected. Well... Of course they're trying to get elected. They're a politician and that's what they try and do. That got nothing to do with whether their arguments for this particular policy are good or bad. That depends on the arguments. So motive, character, position to know, all those things are only relevant when uh, you're asked to believe something just on someone's say-so. They're not relevant when the person's given an argument or presented some evidence if the person's given an argument or presented some evidence, then you ought to evaluate that argument or evidence.
As we'll see in a later topic, even if the evidence that the expert has presented is evidence from a scientific study or something like that, it's still possible to evaluate that scientific study for yourself. You can ask certain key critical questions about it. More generally, experts sometimes get things wrong and when they they usually base their claims on evidence and argument where it's available, you can evaluate those arguments and evidence for yourself. Okay, so I've talked about those three criteria for evaluating sources, both experts and witnesses. Is a source in a position to know? Are there any reasons to suspect their reliability? And is there any independent corroboration from other sources? We're going to look now um, at an example of applying those uh, three criteria to quite an interesting case. So our example concerns the United States uh, invasion of Iraq in 2004. And you will remember, if you're old enough, or you might have read about it, uh, that uh, the United States uh, wanted to have their invasion of Iraq endorsed by the United Nations. They wanted other people to help them, other nations to help them. And so... Colin Powell addressed the United Nations making a case for why um, Iraq presented a global threat. And the claim was that Iraq possessed what became known as weapons of mass destruction, uh, including chemical weapons described by uh, Powell as killer caravans, allowing Saddam Hussein to produce anthrax on demand. Uh, This picture is from one of uh, Colin Powell's PowerPoint slides from that address to the UN, showing what the inside of these lorries that can make chemical weapons looked like. So what was the evidence that the United States had that Iraq did have weapons of mass destruction? They did have this capacity to create uh, chemical weapons. The evidence came from a source, uh, an eyewitness and expert source, uh, someone codenamed Curveball by uh, German intelligence. Not to have um, set off a few alarm bells straight away, but anyway. Um, he was an Iraqi engineering student who defected to Germany, and he claimed to have worked on these mobile chem- chemical labs. He claimed to have seen them and worked on them. So let's apply the three criteria for evaluating sources to curveball and see what we come up with. So question one, is the source in a position to know? Well here we can ask first of all about uh, curveball's expertise. I mean after all you might work somewhere and see chemicals and machinery and have no understanding at all of what any of it does or what it could do. Um, Nonetheless, Curveball had a degree in chemical engineering and he claimed himself to have graduated top of his class. Uh, So if that's true, that would give him some kind of relevant expertise, chemical engineering. You can ask, was the source in the right place at the right time? Um, Well, Curveball claimed to have been hired to work on Iraq's biological weapons program after he left university and he was known to have been in Iraq until 1999 at least when he arrived in Germany wanting to defect. So, so far, so good. Yes, it looks like he could have been in the right place at the right time, and he has some kind of relevant expertise or qualifications for making the claims that he was making. Second question, is there any reason to suspect the reliability of the source? Uh, For example, we can ask the question, does the source have any motive for not telling the truth? And the answer here was, yes, Curveball was seeking asylum in Germany and it emerged that he was um, there was a warrant out for his arrest in Iraq for embezzling government money. So if he was returned to Iraq, he would have faced prison. Um, his application for asylum in Germany would have been uh, greatly strengthened uh, if it was thought he had this important intelligence about um, Iraq's weapons program. 
So he does have a motive for exaggerating or not telling the truth. What was his reputation for reliability? Uh, Well, German intelligence who first uh, interviewed him came to the conclusion that he was very unreliable indeed. For example, he made other claims that uh, they were able to determine couldn't really be true. For example, he claimed to have seen an accident with biological weapons when it was later found he wasn't even in Iraq at the time that accident was supposed to have occurred. They interviewed his friends. They described him as a congenital liar, kind of person who makes things up all the time. So, reputation for reliability not looking so good. As I said, the German intelligence officers who interviewed Curveball and passed all this information on to the CIA, all of this was known to the CIA and to the US government, they described him in their reports about about him to the United States authorities as mentally unstable and probably a fabricator. In other words, German intelligence told the CIA that he was probably making it all up. So, final question, is there any corroborating evidence from independent sources? Did the United States or anyone else have any other reasons, any other witnesses or satellite photography or anything of that nature to back up these claims that Iraq had chemical weapons capabilities? Answer, no, none at all. There were no other witnesses that came forward and no other intelligence pointing in this direction. The entire case was based on the testimony of this one person. So if we made up a simple kind of source reliability scorecard for Curveball, what would he score on position to know? Well, yeah, OK, would do not badly on position to know. He had relevant expertise and could have been there. Reliability, on the other hand, very low, poor reputation for reliability and very strong incentive to make things up. No corroboration whatsoever. Overall, probably not a credible source. Uh, And indeed, of course, as you may know, uh, no mobile chemical weapons labs of any kind were found in Iraq after the United States invasion. No weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons or anything of that nature were found either. Uh, It's quite remarkable that the uh, major element of the case for this war was based on the testimony of this one source who was pretty well known to be not very reliable. So if you're interested in reading more about this story, uh, here are some references to get you started. There are probably quite a lot more available nowadays.